Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome along to the, uh, to the next of our MHPN series of webinars for 2018, Unraveling the Myth of Somatic Symptom Disorder. My name is Dr. Conrad Kunger, I'm a Rural General Practitioner and Proserpine in North Queensland. And it's my great pleasure to, to welcome the uh, 540 panel, uh, participants we've already got uh, joining us for tonight's webinar and those who are also taken the opportunity to, to access the, the recording, the podcast, the later date. Thank you very much to all of you for your, for your participation and for being part of it. Just before I begin, MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the seas and the waterways across Australia on food which our webinar presenters and participants have located. We wish to pay our respects to elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. As I mentioned, I'll be the, uh, the, the facilitator for, for this evening's session. It's always a, a pleasure to be sharing these with you. I'm uh, not a mental health uh, expert. Uh, I'm a, a rural general practitioner, as, as I mentioned, and I always love the opportunity for me to, to learn not only from the, uh, from the panellists, but also from yourselves as the, as the participants who are, who are making sure that you're uh, getting the, the most out of these sessions as well. Now we always acknowledge that, however, that we acknowledge that many people have had difficult experiences in their interactions with the healthcare system and may not have received the kind of best practice care that we might be talking about in this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to give a broader group of health professionals the skills they need so that they can help people more effectively in, in the future. Personal stories of illnesses are very important and MHPN often includes consumers and carers on our panels. The chat box, however, is not a forum for personal stories. It is designed to complement the panel discussion by allowing professionals to share their resources and their experiences of practice. So I'm just going to thank you all in anticipation for, uh, for respecting this for us. So we'll uh, we'll just in introduce the um, the other the other panelists. So I'm first we're going to introduce Liz Muldoon. Liz is a uh, oh, sorry. No, I'll, I'll start off with introducing Associate Professor Louise Stone. Louise is a general practitioner and a academic general practitioner working at the ANU Medical School. Uh, she's got vast experience, not only in general practice, but obviously in mental health, which is a major part of, of our, our work, including leading a number of mental health training programs. Uh, Liz is the, Louise is the, the clinical lead in the Masters of Psychiatry uh, Medical Program at New South Wales Health. And when she was doing her PhD, she actually undertook that further study in ways that GPs assess and manage medically unexplained symptoms. So Louise, welcome along to, to tonight's um, discussion. Just wondering if you might be able to, to share with the, uh, with the audience. You now we're talking tonight about somatic symptom disorder, but the definition can be a bit confusing. Can you tell us how you make a diagnosis? Yeah, sure, Conrad. I mean, one of the problems with the diagnosis of somatic symptom disorder is it's quite new. It's just come into DSM-5, and really it's part of a series of disorders that we um, deal with looking at medically unexplained symptoms where patients present with physical and mental issues together but don't have a physical health diagnosis. Wonderful, thanks, thanks Louise. We're now moving on to uh, Professor Alex Holmes. Uh, Alex is a psychiatrist who's in private practice in Sorry, at the University of Melbourne, and he also um, participates in consultation liaison psychiatry at Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, his interest, in particularly for research, has been on the, the psychiatric sequel of physical illnesses, including serious brain injury, pain, multiple sclerosis, and, and brain tumours. Alex, uh, what are the main disorders listed under the category of somatic symptom and related disorders in DSM-5 that were previously known as somatoform disorders? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Well, the, the DSM-5 under this sort of broad category of somatic symptom relating disorders clearly has, has somatic symptom disorders as one of its uh, major diagnoses, but then there's also the conversion disorder, which is similar to past uh, uh, DSMs, illness anxiety disorder, which is the old hypochondriasis, factitious disorder, which is similar, and psychological factors affecting other conditions. Wonderful. Thanks, Alan. 
And finally, it's a pleasure to introduce you this evening, Liz Muldoon. Liz is a psychologist working in, uh, in the ACT. And her, uh, her area, is, she's been, actually been in, in psychological practice since 2019, although I completed her master's in 2013. As a generalist, Liz has interest in general uh, clinical psychology across the full age spectrum. And as most of you will uh, be participating yourselves, the wide range of psychological difficulties, including anxiety, PTSD, sport performance issues, personality disorders, and somatic, uh, somatic disorders. Um, Liz also has uh, prior practice working in community mental health in New South Wales Health Service, as well as participating in uh, teaching activities with Charles Sturt University. Liz, welcome uh, along to, uh, to the MHVN group. What are some of the risk factors you see sometimes with somatic symptoms? Um, often we see early childhood um, traumatic experiences, so childhood abuse or neglect, um, emotional avoidance, uh, sometimes a childhood history of chronic illness um, and also um, social norms that stigmatise psychological symptoms compared to physical symptoms. Wonderful, excellent. Well, thanks, thanks for that, Liz, and uh, I hope you'll, you'll all enjoy being part of as much as, as we do. As I mentioned earlier, just a few background ground rules that we have to go through for, for this evening. Please, we just make sure that everybody wants to get the most from this live event, so be respectful of other participants and panellists. Even though we're, we're you know, we're far away, we don't want to be keyboard warriors. Remember to treat others as you would be in a face-to-face -face activity. The best way to do that is to interact with each other, each other via the, the chat box. Uh, I'll try the, the best we can to, to get through as many of your uh, questions and, and topics that you raise, but just try to make your comments on topic, keep them brief, that'll be the best chance. However, you uh, don't, put, don't use the chat box for your uh, technical issues you'll find the technical support uh, FAQ tab at the top of your screen. And if that's not helping for you, you can call the Red Health Help Desk on 1800 291 863. Uh, and if there is a, a problem, a technical issue affecting all the participants, we'll be letting you know about that. So for this evening, we're covering, as I mentioned, somatic symptom disorder. And we really want to make sure that everybody gets a, a good opportunity to cover these important learning outcomes. This evening, we're hoping that you'll all come away with, it, with the uh, opportunity to identify practical strategies to deal with a person presenting with medically unexplained symptoms. Recognise the importance of working with families who are carers for someone with somatic disorders, and be able to identify approaches to collaborate with other health professionals to avoid unnecessary investigations and iatrogenic harm. So you've hopefully all had the opportunity to, to read Anna's story. Anna's a, a quite a challenging 35-year-old female. We're not going to have time to, to go back through the whole case study now. But as so often happens in, in all of our practices, she'll be part of the, you know, the, the setting for, for many of us. Louise, uh, we might come to you first. As a general practitioner who might be looking after Anna, how would you go about being part of, uh, part of care for this, this important condition in a patient like her? So Anna is not an unusual uh, presentation for us in general practice. A, a person who has a combination of physical and emotional issues all tied up together, uh, leading to some sort of symptoms that are difficult for us to characterise and diagnose. So at the core of her type of symptoms is, is three things. Um, a, a type of somatisation, which is somatisation is, is a process and it's a tendency to experience conceptualise and communicate mental disorders as physical symptoms. So I think it's important to look at all three, that, that from Anna's point of view, Anna experiences those physical symptoms, they're very real for her. Um, she sees them as coming from a physical cause, so she attributes something, and she turns up to us as, as health professionals to try and get relief for those symptoms. From a GP's perspective, patients like that fall into a number of groups and somatic symptom disorder is one of them, or in Anna's case, perhaps conversion disorder, and I know Alex will talk about this in a minute. But really, patients can turn up with a variety of things. Um, they can turn up with the physical symptoms of depression or anxiety, so it's uh, not unusual, for instance, for patients to come with anxiety disorder to pre present with palpitations to us, for instance, or come in short of breath or with chest pain and actually have depression. But there are other things that they can also have, like Munchausen's disease, that idea of um, presenting in a way causing their own symptoms, or something like Anna, where we feel that the 
symptoms come from a past history of emotional trauma and they've converted into a physical symptom, so a conversion disorder. Um, it's important that we don't think that Anna in this case is malingering. It's not that she's putting it on in order to gain some sort of um, evidence, some sort of outcome from that from us, but certainly there are some patients that um, turn up that way. The, the other three types of presentations are really common for us in general practice and they are quite difficult. It's not unusual for instance for us to see someone with illnesses that haven't yet declared themselves where we know that in the future this patient might present with an autoimmune disease, something like lupus, and we haven't yet been able to work that out. So it's not unusual for us to not be sure yet whether the patient has a physical illness. It's also unfortunately not unusual for patients to present with what we call contested illnesses. So they've gone onto the internet and they've joined a group and they've decided that they've got chronic Lyme disease or, or some sort of unusual uh, multiple chemical sensitivity or something along those lines and come to the GP to try and um, prove that that's the case. And it's certainly not unusual for us to see patients who have what we call chaotic illnesses, so patients with long histories of trauma with layer on layer on layer of difficulties in their lives and now presenting with physical symptoms that seem to be um, in response to chronic and severe stress. I think with patients like Anna, it's really important to try and work out what's what. So from a GP's point of view, it's incredibly important that we try and make a medical diagnosis. Sometimes it's not easy for us to do that and sometimes we have to wait and see over a long period of time, particularly for unusual things like autoimmune diseases that can take a while to present. Um, it's also important for us to make a psychiatric diagnosis so that we make sure that we exclude things like eating disorders or psychosis, those sorts of things. And it's important for us to have a, a sort of broad understanding of what might be going on. So for someone like Anna to think that Perhaps in her past she hasn't been able to express emotions very clearly and so in this circumstance those emotions might be expressing themselves through her body rather than expressing themselves psychologically for her and coming out with a series of symptoms in her body rather than coming out in her mind. I think from GP's point of view that you know there are always four parts to any mental health presentation. No matter what patients come in, they usually come in with some sort of physical sensation like pain or like palpitation, some sort of feelings like uh, anxiety or depression, usually some sort of disordered thoughts or concentration and some sort of unusual behaviour. So in, in Anna's case we're looking at, you know, she's coming in seeking uh, medical help and, and trying to uh, define herself in a very medical way which is unusual. As GPs, our responsibility is very much to try and look at all four sides of the equation and make sure that we keep that open because unfortunately with patients like Anna, they do develop physical uh, illnesses at the same time as their uh, somatization illness. So in this case, her conversion disorder, she may also develop something else. So we have to keep an open mind and make sure that, that we keep looking after Anna as a whole person, not simply as her mental illness. One of the hard things in general practice, of course, is that patients get terribly worried about their illnesses and we're very worried about missing something too. So it can be quite difficult for us to uh, not succumb to the desire to do heaps of MRI scans and CAT scans and get terribly worried about the fact that we might be missing something. The core business for us is to try and validate Anna, that Anna is actually experiencing symptoms and Anna is quite distressed try and give her an explanation that she can understand and to keep that consultation nice and open. To coordinate care and advocacy so that she can get the care that she needs and to manage symptoms as they emerge. And to keep that agenda broad so that Anna can talk about her emotional symptoms as well as her physical symptoms. We don't get stuck into arguments about whether it's really real or not. Um, it's important we protect her from uh, people in the community that can exploit people like Anna. So there's plenty of people who will sell various products that aren't evidence based and certainly patients like Anna sometimes go overseas to clinics and spend a fortune and we, it, it's, in, uh, it's very important as GPs that we try and protect Anna from those sorts of things. 
and also maintain that very empathic approach. Anna is suffering and just because our understanding of why she's suffering is different to Anna's doesn't make that suffering any less real. So I think as a GP they're the main things that would come up for us. That's, that's fantastic, Louise, and a great, a great opening summary of, of where, where things are, are at. Of course, it is a, a challenging diagnosis and a challenging condition to be able to, to manage and to, uh, to, to take on. Uh, Alex, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, yeah, as, as perhaps the, the treating psychiatrist who, who might be asked to, to give some advice on where we go next with Anna, how would you take on her care? Well, following on from what Louise has said and perhaps sort of uh, emphasising some of its details, um, the key in managing patients like Anna is, is, is confidence in, in the diagnosis, which to a certain degree will always be challenged by her alternative perspective around her symptoms. In Anna's case, uh, despite the title of the seminar, rather than having a somatic symptom disorder, she clearly has a conversion disorder. So she has a a neurological style symptom which is incompatible with what we know about uh, neurology and medical conditions and it's not better explained by any other condition. But faced with her, uh, her uh, preoccupation that this is a physical disorder and uh, our nagging concerns about not getting things wrong, how can we be confident? Well, I think this, this tests our very, the very nature of medical practice. We, we understand these things in uh, physiological and pathological terms, such that there are, there's a point where a constellation of symptoms cannot viably result from a single lesion, and then our knowledge of multi-lesion pathology indicates that once those uh, disorders, such as multiple sclerosis or uh, multiple strokes have been excluded. Um, the diagnosis one can confidently make as a conversion disorder. Um, there's always this concern about getting it wrong, and uh, but the reassuring aspect of, uh, of the modern diagnosis is the current literature really suggests that this is very rare. So once one has made a reasonably confident diagnosis of conversion disorder, only a very small percent, and Primlisk is a kind of reasonably recent study, perhaps less than 5% of patients will actually go on to develop a, an organic condition which fully or partly explain their periods of symptoms. So one can be, in other words, 95% certain of the diagnosis at least. So once the diagnosis is made, before one communicates this with a patient, it's worthwhile uh, building a formulation. Now, a formulation is a hypothesis. It's not a, a gold standard fact, but it's a, a, an idea or a set of ideas that can change over time. But start you start with, which answers, answers the question, why is Anna presenting with this problem now? There may be a recent psychological persistence, such as a loss or a bereavement or an abandonment, but Recent literature really indicates that this is probably only present in about half of the patients. There may be the risk factors that we've already alluded to, and it's common you'll find sort of developmental challenges or early exposure to physical illnesses or cultures within families that promote somatic rather than physical expression. The final piece of the puzzle is, is often um, the people around the person, whether they're solicitous, supporting of the symptom, uh, take a very somatic uh, perspective or um, in some cases take that one step further and have a sort of some sort of something to gain from the person having a physical illness some some cohesion occurs when uh, a family is, is sort of directed towards helping a symptom whether it be actually caused by a physical illness or not so once we have this confidence, the next step is to communicate it to the patient. Now the, the truth is that this will often occur in primary care. Uh, patients often won't uh, embrace this sort of notion of a psychological cause in the first instance and they um, uh, won't see a psychologist or a psychiatrist even to confirm that diagnosis. So one's left um, to the best of one's ability trying to communicate the diagnosis. 
And although there's no sort of set script, the sort of general approach is to, as we've already discussed, clearly state that something is wrong. But the good news is that we've excluded major progressive neurological illness, that the, the symptom is a manifestation of some sort of stress that's impacting the nervous system. Um, sometimes the term functional somatic symptom is used, and that's a, a term that's available on the web and people will search. We don't exactly know what causes this. So there's allowing a degree of uncertainty in which both you and the patient can kind of exist rather than absolute certainty about what the cause may or may not be. That's indicating that the focus of treatment is providing support, simple goals, and uh, if there is a stress component involved, identifying the source of that and helping if, if possible. It may be that over time, the patient embraces this and is willing to kind of consider engagement with other practitioners such as the physiotherapist or exercise physiologist or even a psychologist and a psychiatrist. The management is a way, in a way, is about avoiding the kind of uh, relapsing to an argument about whether this is in my head or this is physical uh, and allowing some way the patient to kind of make a transition from their conviction that this is physical to the possibility that this may be due to sort of a broader holistic problem. And that requires a pathway where they can um, make that adaption, which is without undue pressure and aware that they may feel some degree of shame or embarrassment or fear about the possibility of it being a psychological condition. It's always important to identify and enhance the mature aspects of the patient. The, the aspects of the patient that aren't happy with the symptom, that want to improve, that um, uh, want to embrace uh, life challenges despite the symptom. And when that sort of a success occurs, it's, I think it's impositive to highlight that in the same way that uh, moving away from current discussions about diagnosis is important. My final comments are that these patients are difficult to treat. They're difficult for in primary care, they're difficult in specialist care. The very symptom in itself challenges the nature of medical practice. We often feel frustrated and the patient often feels frustrated. The frustration expressed at us may be about not doing more investigations, or not believing them, or Anna may be upset that we're not fixing her. Our frustrations towards Anna may be at the fact that she's <laughs> expressing hostility to us or that she may, uh, in fact, question our competence or commitment. There's that longer-term challenge of lack of change or an entrenchment in the symptom, and a refusal to sort of even embrace the possibility of a psychological dimension. But that part and parcel of sitting with the patient involves accepting these frustrations. Fantastic, Council. Oh, Thanks, thanks so much for, for that, uh, that, that, that great depth into what is a really challenging area. Liz, there's, there's no question that, uh, that Anna is really going to, to need a, a good therapeutic relationship with a, a skilled therapist in this area. Uh, as the, the treating psychologist who might be looking after her, what, what would you bring to, to the care of a patient like Anna? Uh, yeah, I guess much the same as Louise and Alex talked about. I guess as a psychologist, what is important as it is with all clients that we work with is to develop that comprehensive case formulation. Um, as Alex said, it's important in the case of Anna to try and understand why she's presenting with these symptoms and whether they're physical or psychological at this time and under these circumstances. We need to consider those possible predisposing and precipitating factors, but I think most importantly, what we need to look at is what's currently maintaining her symptoms. So, as Alex mentioned, um, secondary gain, care eliciting, emotional avoidance, accommodation by family members. Uh, this formulation will then not only help you better understand the client's symptoms, but I think it can also then be used to share with the client to help them develop some insight into possible causes and maintenance factors for their symptoms. Um, I find that if you work collaboratively with the client to develop a hypothesis around what might be going on for them, that can be the best way to develop a shared understanding of the problem. 
I think one of the biggest challenges, again, as Alex mentioned, was that in working with clients such as Anna, engaging them in um, treatment can be quite difficult because they do not recognise their symptoms as being in any way psychologically related. Um, Anna, for example, denied any mental health concerns and she reported not being overly concerned by her physical symptoms as well. So the question then becomes how do we engage her? I think in, first and foremost um, is that we make the client feel heard and listened to. And it often means avoiding jumping straight into challenging their beliefs around their symptoms um, and trying to diagnose necessarily straight away. Um, rather, I think it's trying to understand again the impact their symptoms is having on them. Specifically focusing on the psychological impact of the somatic symptoms rather than merely the cause of the symptoms and the possible medical etiology. In the case of Anna, for example, you might try exploring other reasons she might benefit from seeing a psychologist, um, such as the noted impact on her occupational functioning. You can also try to build Anna's insight by discussing the link between our mind and our body. Um, and overall, I guess, again, we just want to develop a shared understanding and often the best way to do that is by validating the client and their experience. To them, these symptoms are real and they're real for them and distressing for them. So providing validation and empathy, I think, is key. Uh, the treatment, I guess, of somatic symptom disorders, I guess, requires a multifaceted approach um, that is tailored specifically to the needs of the individual client. Um, the research, I guess, is still limited, but of that that does exist, CBT and mindfulness-based therapy have shown some promise in the treatment of somatic disorders. I think regardless of the modality used, the main goal of treatment is to improve the client's functioning. We want to build the client's emotional awareness and understanding um, so that, the, I guess, we find that if the client becomes more attuned to their emotional experiences, there's a greater likelihood they might consider a link between their physical symptoms and a possible psychological explanation underlying them. And we also want to explore with the client their coping style. Um, in the case of Anna, it's apparent that she's quite emotionally avoidant. Um, and I guess exploring that and discussing with her that can help possibly make links between that coping style and her presentation. Um, and then we want to introduce more effective ways to cope with her symptoms. I think it's also very beneficial, obviously, to provide psychoeducation on the etiology of somatic symptoms and how these can manifest both physically and psychologically. I guess finally, in working with cases such as Anna, it's important we collaborate with other health professionals and family. I think we really want to focus on um, removing any false beliefs that might arise um, from both health professionals and the family. Um, particularly the suggestion that the client is faking or seeking attention. Um, working with clients such as Anna can be slow and quite a challenging process. And for psychologists, the main focus really needs to be on building the therapeutic alliance and creating a safe place for the client to discuss their concerns. I think it's also beneficial if we try to upskill the family as much as possible on ways in which they can validate and support the client um, while also not reinforcing or accommodating their symptom for any dysfunctional behaviour. I think overall pa patience and a shared understanding from all that's involved is, is key in treating um, someone like Anna. Wonderful, Thank, thanks for that. There's a, uh, a, a, yeah, it's, it's difficult, but it, it can be done. You know, it, it, it's just taking that first step and uh, being confident to, to take on the care of Anna and, and patients like her and, and really do the best that you can. So we move on to the question and answer uh, part of the, the, the presentation now, and we've got a, a few uh, a few fantastic questions which are coming up in the in the, the, the chat box, which we'll move on to. But just going to cover some of those which we uh, had at the initial registration questions. Louise, I'm just going to put the first question to you. Uh, managing patients with medically unexplained symptoms in primary care certainly can be very difficult and, and challenging. How would you suggest health professionals guard against transference in, in these instances? I think Liz has raised a really important point there about the shared frustration. You know, we share a lot with these clients. We worry that we'll miss something. It's like they worry that we'll miss something. We worry that um, we'll get sucked into uh, their perspective on the world. And these patients, um, present to us often with symptoms and they often their symptoms change over time. And as GPs, 6% of our patients have rare diseases. So it's quite often that we're looking at things wondering if there's something 
we might have missed it. We might have not covered off. So our anxiety can be raised. I think the main thing is something that Alex said, which is we need to be confident that we've covered the major uh, medical illnesses that are most likely. Um, even when we do keep an open mind, because these patients, they do get hypertension, they do get cardiac disease, they do get other things. So GPs in particular, one of the things that we need to do is to be confident of our diagnosis and to keep, um, keep a good relationship going with the patient. And that often means remembering to ourselves just how much this patient is suffering and just how much they value our care and making sure that the patient remains front and centre of our concerns rather than spending our time worrying ourselves sick about whether or not a disease is likely to emerge that we're unable to diagnose. And that's very difficult, um, particularly when you're a young GP in practice, it can be particularly difficult because you do worry that one of those rare diseases may emerge at any given point and that's always a bit of a concern for you. So seeking help from peers is always really helpful, I think, for these patients to make sure that you keep yourself on track. Indeed. Uh, Alex, we've had a, a few questions asking about the, the role of um, medications in, in treating patients like Anna. What would your advice be to, to those colleagues? Well, um, in short, there's no role for medication in Anna's case. However, what we're hoping for is some evolution. We don't want her to be stuck, and it may be in the course of a good psychotherapy where she's been able to explore some underlying issues that someone who is avoidant or has alexithymic features starts to develop some symptoms. So is, is if, like any other patient, she was developed significant anxiety, generalized anxiety or even panic or depressive symptoms, one must always be prepared to say, look, we have a new psychological or psychiatric condition that requires treatment. But in the first instance, the medications no role in the treatment of conversion disorder. No, that's, a, that, that, that's great. I, I, I like also one of the comments from one of our audience that, 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 uh, that this actually you know, does affect nervous system, uh, it does lead to nervous system dysregulation and, and it might be that actually we don't want to further cloud that, that picture with putting in medications which we, we don't think are going to make that much of a, a benefit. Liz, um, Great question here that was put in about, does the diagnosis of somatoform symptom disorder require that the patient is highly anxious or absolutely preoccupied with their symptoms? Um, yes, according to DSM-5, I guess somatic symptom disorder does require that the client um, be either highly anxious or preoccupied with their physical symptoms. Um, as you know, um, the DSM-5 categorises it as somatic symptom um, disorder and related disorders and conversion disorder, um, which is what Anna's presenting with, um, doesn't necessarily have to come uh, with that level of psychological distress or acknowledgement of that. Often there's a lack of concern about the nature or implications of symptoms um, associated with conversion disorder. Um, and often the psychological distress is often at the unconscious level. So that's sometimes where the family um, and collaboration with them might be important to determine if there is conflict or um, an impact on functioning um, that the client may not be acknowledging but is evident to those around them. Right. Louise, Rina has put a, a really uh, interesting question here about when do you differentiate the diagnosis of somatic disorder and chronic persistent pain following injury? It's a, it's a great one that a lot, of, uh, a lot of participants have been asking about. Yeah, pain's interesting, isn't it? And I think over time, there's been so much discussion about this area, about what diagnoses apply. And every time a new DSM comes out, a new set of words and diagnoses come up. I think what's really important is to understand that actually pain is, the, the research around pain is helping us a lot in this category because we're understanding more and more about central sensitization to pain and the way that um, over time, chronic stress and various emotional states can upregulate our pain management system. So I think over time we're going to find that a lot of these diagnoses overlap 
And I have no doubt that when we get to DSM-6, there'll be another set of classifications and another set of diagnostic names, because I'm not really sure that we've got it right. But I do think that idea that comes from the pain literature, that, um, that we can have neurological changes secondary to chronic stress and certainly to early trauma, helps us a lot in understanding why patients like Anna can present with physical symptoms that run along neurological paths. Fantastic. I also had the, uh, the important question about what, what happens when we've got uh, patients who are continuing to, to present in the emergency departments or going through different, different practices. Uh, Alex, I guess there's been plenty of occasions where you've been called by a frustrated medical team to, to come in and see the patients. How do you manage when, uh, when patients are, are you know, representing time after time and, and not, uh, not willing to, to engage with the, uh, the, the, the diagnosis? Well, I, um, I, I, I think this is common, and the key concept is communication. Um, communication of the core opinion. So I think in those patients, it's very important that, important that, if possible, someone with a certain amount of expertise can sort of authoritatively make the diagnosis and then communicate that to as many people as possible that may be uh, attached to some treatment recommendations which would very much be along the lines of the things we've already discussed. Um, and it's about sort of uh, staying the course. I think there'll always be situations where individual practitioners will feel that they want to... Yeah, that, that demonstration that we're there for them for the long, the long haul with, with this, that, uh, that we're not expecting this to be uh, just a, a five-minute episode of care that this is going to take some time to properly work through. And uh, Archer, I think we'd, we'd also all agree with you that nobody wants to make this type of diagnosis early, um, that it, it's, it's something which we, we need to, to take seriously. Uh, now, there's also some, some questions coming through about the link with fibromyalgia and chronic pain syndrome as well, that um, Paul's mentioned about that that, that can certainly call nervous system dis dysregulation. Uh, is, there, is there any overlap with what we know with fibromyalgia and, uh, and somatic symptom disorder or conversion disorder at all? Um, I'm happy to make a, a comment, but I'm sure other people will have a comment. Look, uh, these are diagnostic systems. They're not sort of... Uh, clinico-pathological entities where we have, have, understand everything. So, of course, what is described under the rubric of uh, chronic fatigue may well sit under the same rubric of chronic, uh, of a somatic symptom disorder. And um, often what's being implied, though, in choosing one diagnosis or the other is the hope of the persistence of or the persistence of the idea that there is an underlying medical cause which can be found and, and treated. Again, the, the, the management rep is, is one would recommend to try and stay away from that kind of discourse because it seldom leads anywhere productive. So, you know, if, if a patient wants to, um, feels that chronic fatigue is a good descriptor for them and you feel that this uh, somatic symptom disorder is also a descriptor, I don't think it matters too much as, as long as you can agree that the patient is uh, suffering and has has difficulties and that you're willing to stay with them and as much as possible hate them, help them to progress to a sort of better functional state. Can I just add to that? Um, yeah, I, I please, agree please. with you. I agree with that, Alex, um, in primary care. I often try and get past what is true and start to look at what is helpful. Uh, because what happens with these patients is that you start with them very entrenched and you try and ease sideways just gradually over time until they begin to accept uh, more emphasis on their psychological state and the way that that's emerging. I don't think there needs to be a very distinct moment when you are definite about whether it's one thing or another. That idea of helpfulness is actually very important. And I do think over time we've learned a lot more about, for instance, the neurological consequences of early childhood trauma. We know that it causes changes in the neurological system. So I think over time um, some of these diagnoses like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia will begin to understand a lot more in psychological terms and neurological terms and the way those two intersect. 
for sure, for sure. Of course, there's a whole lot of extra stuff about trauma which we probably just aren't going to be able to, to get into with, uh, with, with this session. And uh, I know that it's something that a lot of, uh, a lot of participants are, are asking about. Um, Alex, we'd, we'd mentioned about, uh, about those types of techniques. Liz, have you found any particular techniques that are most suitable when you can't, find, when you can't elicit an underlying trauma, when there's, when there's no clear trigger to, to address? Um, I guess, yeah, the main focus is still on the impact that it's having on the client in um, currently, I guess, like looking at whether it's an occupational it's impacting on them occupationally or socially. Um, usually by the time they've come to us, um, there's some kind of acknowledgement that it's affecting them in some way. Um, and perhaps at the start, it's just exploring that with them as to what, how is their life affected by these symptoms, um, rather than trying to, I guess as a psychologist, steering away from whether, they're, um, whether there's a medical explanation or not, but looking just more at what does it mean to, for them to have these symptoms, what, is it, what does their life look like? What would they like their life to look like um, in terms of managing these symptoms? So I think it's more working with them um, to develop that kind of understanding around the impact more than anything else. And Liz, I might just ask you to, to expand on that a little bit because uh, Malia has, has asked about, you know, how do you actually, what, what, what might be some of those simple steps in, in establishing that uh, that therapeutic rapport before you actually engage into the psychoeducation. I, I guess that these are often going to be patients who are very cynical or, or perhaps sceptical about their, their, the, the importance of uh, proper psychological therapy and how they engage into it. Uh, so Malia, I think, is just asking for some, some pragmatic tips about, about some of the steps you might suggest going through. Yeah, I guess um, that, that's important. I think for myself, when I'm working with clients such as this, paying attention to the referral first and foremost before I even see the client, make kind of note that they perhaps won't be so open um, or willing to engage. And so the first step, I guess, is really to just spend some time in that initial kind of assessment phase, just building a relationship, um, explaining the different ways in which psychology might be able to help them, um, perhaps looking past just the fact that um, we only see people who have a mental health diagnosis, but we also help, I guess, other people who just, in terms of emotion regulation strategies and coping skills and, you know, um, I guess talking to them about um, patients that we have worked with who do have um, medical issues, chronic pain, and how they can benefit from um, psychological services as well. But I would spend those first few sessions just really working on building um, a relationship with the client and I guess engaging them um, and I guess that it's always dependent on the client that um, is sitting in front of you as to how best um, to do that but letting them feel heard I think is the most important part and, and part of that will probably be just their frustration with the process and the number of perhaps uh, medical um, uh, practitioners they've seen or procedures that they've had and the lack of answers that they've got and just being able to validate um, their, their struggle with that is often sometimes the best way to initially engage them. Fantastic. I hope that that, uh, that helps a bit there. Alex, we're also getting uh, quite a few questions about just some of the, I guess maybe iatrogenic um, effects of our, of our therapies. Uh, so a lot of participants are asking about the autonomic uh, impact of, of somatoform symptom disorder and that's perhaps some of the uh, some of the, 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 the traditional uh, tools we might use, mindfulness, uh, relaxation therapy, and the like, might not really be the the, uh, the most appropriate in that that setting. I'm I'm sorry to those, those therapists who are much more conversed in those therapies than I am. But uh, Alex, is there any harm that we're likely to in, inflict with uh, with any of our usual therapeutic measures for these patients? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think the literature is very Strong on this, um, uh, I, I, we, uh, um, Liz has always already mentioned that the sort of perhaps the sort of cognitive challenging is not something that one necessarily wants to embark on early. That's been a constant theme. But the those kind of uh, strategies, which if they 
uh, provide some sort of whole body relief or mind body relief can be an interesting starting point in in change in as much as maybe Anna can um, uh, do some relaxation therapy and then she can sort of acknowledge that maybe afterwards she felt a little bit more relaxed or she uh, she felt a bit stronger or you know her, her she uh, she moved a bit better and that that can and then one can take the conversation not to aha I told you it was all in the mind but to isn't it interesting how these things kind of interact uh, when you feel sort of better in yourself you feel stronger in yourself when you feel stronger in yourself you're better in yourself that these kind of very general kind of um, accepting the complexity of the human condition um, which again allows a space into which the patient can somewhat change the way they think about their symptoms. Uh, great, great perspective there. Louise, Melinda's raised a, a really interesting question that I, I hadn't actually thought about myself, is that we, we know that, uh, you know, as we've already mentioned, that a lot of the pharmaceutical therapies don't have any great role. Um, and we, we know that properly engaging in psychological therapy is, is beneficial. We've also talked a bit about occupational therapy and, and, uh, and physic, uh, physical therapies as well in, in this, this area, but we haven't really thought about what happens if we do nothing. Melinda's asking, what actually is the prognosis for somebody like Anna if there's no treatment or, or no psychological intervention and we, we basically just most on you know, lifestyle intervention, good you know, support the things we do in general practice, you know, nutrition, activity, uh, good, uh, good sleep patterns, all those types of areas. I think one of the things that's terribly important is protecting her from harm. There are a lot of practitioners out there that will recommend all sorts of not evidence based things for someone like Anna. She will go online and she'll be recommended everything from uh, therapies, particularly overseas type therapies and those sorts of things. One of the things I think is really important in general practice is to try and keep the relationship going with someone like her so that she doesn't spend her time lurching from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. I think the harm is very much in um, entrenching her idea that there's something wrong because every time she goes to a new practitioner they start from the beginning and they do another raft of tests and that just is a social iatrogenesis. It embeds in her mind that there must be something wrong and if she finds the right practitioner then they will discover it and so she she invests more and more in her, of her life in trying to find the, the answer. And unfortunately, you will find one on the internet. It just won't necessarily be correct. So I think it's very important that we, we keep those conversations open in the hope that, as Alex says, that gradually she begins to make the link that, that her stress levels impact on her symptoms. But I just comment on physical therapies. There's good evidence for physical therapy, things like massage, for hydrotherapy, for those sorts of things, in trying to um, relieve these sorts of symptoms and also to assist her in, in her management of her physical symptoms. So I do encourage um, anything that helps the patient become more aware of what their body is doing. Often I find with these sorts of patients, they're not terribly aware of the way that their emotions work and the way that their bodies work. And so trying to make that link with massage or hydrotherapy or, or movement. And I sometimes, even with young people, we sometimes use things like martial arts where there's a bit of a connection between the mind and body and they can explore that connection a little bit in the hope that she will gain that insight over time. So yes, I think the main thing from a primary care perspective is to try and, and actively do nothing, which is actually a lot harder than it sounds. And uh, Liz, I guess that brings us back to the the burden of if we aren't active, aren't we, if we aren't being seen to actively do more investigations, more more uh, medications, uh, and we're really you know, in, engaging in this this area of therapy instead, then we do worry about the uh, the loading or the or the the, the the burnout load for the carers and, and the family around the, the patient. How how would you suggest? best protecting the, the family or the carers to uh, to insulate them from, from that type of, of load? Um, I think as much as you possibly can, uh, engaging um, family and carers in the therapy process um, would be important, uh, obviously with the consent of the client, but really um, providing a lot of psychoeducation, I think, for the family um, in regards to um, 
why these physical symptoms are presenting um, and their link, I guess the same in way you would with Anna explaining to her the, the link between the psychological and the physical um, and that, um, I guess, removing kind of or answering their questions around what's going on because I think they can sometimes over time just get a bit fed up and um, kind of feel like, you know, they say unhelpful things like it's all in your head and, you know, you just, you know, you're making it up and things like that. And I think to be able to help them um, frame their frustration perhaps to to the client in a way that's um, um, more well understood and I guess with a more um, validating and empath empathic approach. Um, so I would spend a lot of time ed um, educating the family and then also talking to them about more effective ways they can communicate um, to the to the person. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Annabelle and, and Karen have, have raised a really, really frightening prospect that uh, patients with medically unexplained symptoms being subjected to unnecessary operations and actually undergoing surgery and, and that, that is indeed terrifying. We know that there are plenty of areas of surgery where we recognise that there's potential underlying psychological issues and, and make sure that we get a thorough assessment done beforehand. But uh, for anybody to to under unnecessarily go operation would would be horrifying in this this area. Um, well, there's a lot of fantastic questions that are, that are coming in from the the participants, and a lot of extra resources. Now, a lot of you have made references to uh, overseas authors and and guidelines. Uh, I'd also encourage you all to use the resources folder, which has been supplied. Uh, you'll, you'll find that on the, the bottom right of the of the screen down here and uh, there, there might be some of that which you are able to, to get some benefit from into your own practice with this, this very challenging area. Uh, we might actually just take a, a couple of moments now just for each of the, uh, the panellists to, to reflect on the, the case and the discussion tonight and, uh, and just to, to sum up for us. Louise, we might just go to, to you first. I think the main thing with Anna is to be prepared to hold the uncertainty. You will never absolutely be convinced that Anna has no physical um, underlying disease. None of us can be convinced that we have no underlying disease. What's important with Anna is to continue to care for her the best way that we can. And that's not about arguing the money issue or whether there's a diagnosis, whether there's not a diagnosis in terms of physical health. That's about promoting the most helpful way for Anna to live in the world um, in a way that is most healthy and helpful for her. So I think trying not to get caught up in that anxiety that we might be missing one of those 6% of very rare diseases for us as GPs is hugely important and focusing more on what is it that Anna needs and what she needs is empathy and support and validation to help her understand why she is the way she is in the world and to help improve that over time. Right. Alex, I'll give you an opportunity just to, uh, to, to summarise uh, for tonight as well. Okay. Well, look, at, clearly from what we said, this is very difficult work and in a way allowing the possibility that it's not going to work, that if you're going to engage in trying to help some of these patients, some of these patients are going to sack you on the spot and you're going to feel useless and they're going to disappear and not let that colour your approach to your next patient. They are difficult but with, um, with some patients we can have significant um, successes over time and, um, uh, and when that does occur I think it's very rewarding. Indeed. Liz, I, I will just uh, a, a lot of a lot of participants are really asking about how do we how do we manage the the trauma. I'm I'm not sure that we're uh, we're able to to get through the trauma therapies in uh, in this this area. We've, we've got plenty of other webinars uh, which have dealt more effectively with with post traumatic uh, issues and and recovery, uh, but I don't know if that's something which you'd be able to to cover in, in a summary at all? Uh, briefly. Um, I guess with, the client has to be at a position where they're prepared to um, discuss and acknowledge the trauma. As with any case when you're working with trauma, you need to um, have the client be 
at a stage where that's something that you can do with them. In the case of Anna, you wouldn't um, go there um, for quite some time until you kind of helped her understand the impact um, um, of her symptoms and her emotional avoidance and, you know, the, I guess, the situations that she's been through and um, the possible impact that they've had on her. She's um, quite convinced she's fine and nothing's a problem and they've all been okay. Um, and I guess, you know, maybe reflecting that those things aren't necessarily, um, those things are challenges, I guess, that people would find distressing and traumatic um, and then explore that gently, very gently with someone like Anna. Um, and then you'd go into all the, the trauma work if that was um, something that the client was actually willing to do. It's consent from the client that you need to do that trauma work. And you won't get that unless they've actually got an awareness that it's an issue. It's really that all come back to that insight, doesn't it? That's, that's absolutely right. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for what's been a, a really, really engaging session. And we, we knew from the, the start that Sadly, we're going to open up a lot more questions and we're going to be able to get answers too. But still, I think for, for all of us, uh, as we've discussed earlier, being able to accept unexplained symptoms and, and illnesses where sometimes we just don't always have, have the answer, but that, being able to, to move past that and, and to, to move on really is a, is a professional step that all of us probably would be delighted to know that we've, uh, that we've got in our, our armamentarium. So the upcoming sessions for, for MHPN, um, we've got the final BPD um, webinar on management in mental health services for primary and private sectors coming up next week on Monday the 26th of November. And then we've also got a webinar on psychological treatments for trichotillomania, a very interesting area that's coming up on the, the 6th of December. So I'd encourage anybody who's interested to, to register for, for either of those. Of course, MHPN uh, supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, uh, share tips or resources, build local referral networks and, and pathways, and uh, engage in their CPD activities. So to learn more about joining or even starting a local practitioner network, please don't hesitate to, to contact. MHPN or go onto the new section of the website uh, and that's also where you can find your interest on the, the exit survey that you'll be, you'll be seeing. So please do make sure that you do complete the, uh, the exit survey before you log out. We really do take your, your comments on board and they, they've made a, a tremendous impact in being able to help us develop the, uh, the, the, the programs that, that, you, that you need. Um, we also, that's also the, we make sure that you uh, get the correct details for your attendance certificate, which will be emailed out to you in the, the next uh, the next month or so. And uh, you'll also be emailed at that stage a link to the resources which we mentioned as being online. So we're just going to take this final opportunity to uh, to thank the uh, thank the, the, the panelists uh, for for what has been a, a fantastic session. And to all of you for your illuminating and really, really thoughtful comments that you've been, been uh, sharing with us tonight. Thank you so much, everybody, and I hope that you've enjoyed the session.